Welcome to Afterlives with Kara Cooney, in which we discuss ancient Egyptian history and relevant current events that we think will be of interest to our audience. I am Kara Cooney, and I'm a professor of Egyptology at UCLA. This podcast is separate from my teaching and research roles at UCLA. In recent years, I've become active in communicating with the general public about the history of ancient Egypt through lectures, interviews, social media, books, and guest appearances. This podcast is my opportunity to take the kinds of deep dives into history that are not always possible in academic formats. Okay, episode three, here we are. The Religious Roots of Authoritarianism in Ancient Egypt. This was filmed April 1st. Of the pandemic of of 2020. Yes, and so this was the height of the New York when everything was really bad in New York. Um, Again, we have issues, just, you know, what was going on then, issues with Keynote dropping slides and hiding things. I remember being your TA and being like, why is Keynote? Why did it do that? It was hiding things. And and when you made it into a PDF, it would just take slides out. And there was an option of when you would trans, when you would save it, there was an option to like only do like hidden versus unhidden, but we figured it out. Don't they know that people like us exist and that we can't handle those kinds of details? Got to keep it's it too hard. Got to keep it spicy. Um, but this was about divine. It was about religion and authoritarianism. Yeah, like Nature Ah versus Nature ah, okay. Nefer, Ak- yeah. Akhenaten as the case study, Echinoclasm, things like this. But okay. I think, you know, this is we started teaching the course for the undergrads about divine kingship yeah. and thinking about these. I think to your book, I think right when you're starting to get all your thought, thoughts and ideas together. Um, yeah, the d- divine kingship is um, it's a big topic. That was the topic of the entire class. Uh, how do people pull power through religion to have the right to rule over you so that you can't even say no? Yeah. And if it's not religion, then they use some other ideology. Communist ideology mm-hmm. is an example where God has nothing to do with it, but they're pulling power from that ideological source. I would say in this country, we pull power from a different ideological source and I'm removing evangelical Christianity, puritanical evangelical mm-hmm. Christianity for the time being. And if you take that whole um, godliness out of it, you can still create an ideology of the veteran um, worshiping mm-hmm. that hero, the patriotism mm-hmm. of the American flag and the sacrifice that has to be made for it. Mm-hmm. Um, and all of those things that are uh, unquestioned and really, really you can't criticize in any way without being seen as um, highly problematic because they're <laughs> they're protected by a kind of divine aura yeah. in a sense. And I think this episode's good introduction to some of the later ones where you do more focused case studies to mentioning, especially, you know, chapters from books and Wazerit, things like this. So watch this one first. And then I think it will give you a lot of context and background to, to later episodes. And apparently I linked up ancient Egyptian stuff, the Netra A'a and Netra Nefer. Nefer. Great God versus perfected God. The great God being Amun-Re or the sun God and the perfected God, the one that needs to be perfected being the human being that's connecting. And how, you know, Akhenaten is such a good case study. I think most people have heard of him. So when you are watching this, think of all these things and yeah, enjoy. Hey everyone, um, how, how's everyone doing? Good? Um, talked to my brother and sister-in-law and family in New York not long ago. Um, difficult place to be, so um, everyone in New York, keep washing your hands, stay inside, stay safe. Um, yesterday I had um, an hour and a half of technical difficulties of not being able to get my um, Zoom to work with my PowerPoint and then with my Keynote. And then it kept dropping slides out of Keynote. If anyone knows on an iPad why Keynote skips slides, not on my iPad, but then in Zoom, you know, give me a line, drop me a line, because I don't understand that. So I ended up changing it to a PDF. And, um, and taping my two lectures for my class. And so now on our course website, you log in, you can watch my video of me teaching here in my office about all of these things. Um, and 
and there's the PowerPoint that's like this big and then the professor is like a tiny little part of the, of the screen. So like you watch me and then you can like squish my head in like the corner of the of the screen. So it's um it's a strange and bizarre way um to teach, but we're making it work and um it's good. Um hey Brian, how you doing? Um Hey, Emanuela, Emanuela, <laughs> I don't know if I, Emanuel, <laughs> I don't know if I said it right. Hey, Chris, how you doing? Um, so I thought I would let you know a little bit of what I was teaching, just give you some, some slides. So the course is da, 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 Authoritarianism and Divine Kingship in Ancient Egypt, which is kind of a great topic, right? Um, who doesn't want to know about authoritarianism and divine kingship and the ideology of kingship? I actually had an insight while I was teaching the class. Um, and and I'll, I'll show you another image in a second. But first, the insight. The insight was that, um, you know, how can a man be divine when he's going to die, when he has a, a friable human body? This isn't something that, you know, how do people believe something like that? Well, the Egyptians, they, they were clever and they used ideology in a way to make a human being of um, finite lifetime still divine by differentiating that king in terms of their language and, um, and mental understanding from a god. So a god like the sun god Ray or the goddess Hathor, these are nature ah uh -uh. Nature meaning god, ah uh -uh meaning great. And a nature ah uh -uh, is um, the god of the Nile, the god of the sky, the god of the earth, all of, all of these things. The king is a Necher Nefer, the good god, the perfect god. So Necher is the word for god and Nefer is the word for good or perfect. And you know, it's interesting that this is where my little insight came in as I was teaching my class. But the word Nefer is not um, easy to define for us today. We don't know exactly what this word nefer means. And you'll see some people translate it simply as good, very simple, basic, um, vague word. And other people translate it as perfect, um, less vague, more specific. Um, if there is perfect, the implication is that there is imperfect in the world. So in a way, the, the nefer part of the Necher Nefer is the means of, of idealizing, of reifying how you can have a human being of friable body and finite lifetime turn into a god. It is, um, it's almost like the Egyptians are giving away the fact that this is ideological spin by calling it Necher Nefer. He has been perfected. He has been made ideal. He has been made, um, made good. And so they're they're taking this human being and they're and they're kind of forcing him into this category of of being the most perfect of humans or the only perfect human. Um, and the nefer part is the ideological glue holding the whole system together. You guys can disagree. It's an idea. Um, not sure. But um, I started the class with what I think is the most clear example of authoritarianism in ancient Egypt, where it goes too far. Um, no, it's not the Great Pyramid, though that will be one of our case studies built by Khufu of Dynasty IV. But instead, it is, um, can you see this at all? Ah, oh, crap, you can't. Let's go to the next one. Um, no, you can't see it. It is, yeah, this you can probably see. Um, Akhenaten, there, that's, that's clear, right? So Akhenaten of Dynasty 18, and, let's, and I'm trying to get it without glare. There, uh, there we go. Um, here he is underneath the Aten sun disk, and he's got Nefertiti's great royal wife on one side, he's on the other. He has strange body, strange limbs, um, strange look to his face. His children all look like weird skeleton babies. He's got this weird belly that's hanging over his kilt, big hips and thighs. Um, he is a Necher Nefer, of course, a, a good god. He is um, also this um, king who decided to change the religion, pull the old polytheistic religion up by the roots and replant it in a different form in a different way. He changes his own name from Akhenaten, um, from Amenhotep, the, um, Amenhotep to Akhenaten. And there's an image of this, of this new name. I know it's hard for you to see. 
um, changes his own name, um, creates a new capital city, um, builds new temples um, from the ground up. Can you see that? Um, that's a little harder to see. Oh, stupid screens. It's hard to show my PowerPoint. It's too bad. Um, gets rid of all of the other temples either by taking their funding away um, or through outright destruction because there is evidence that Akhenaten, once he renamed himself and created this new Aten religion, this new Aten cult and these new Aten temples, sent all of his um, sent all of these minions out amongst um, around Egypt to destroy images of the god Amun. Now, we humans have done these things before, right? We know what iconoclasm is. We know what Henry VIII did with all of the icons. We know what, what happened to the Bamiyan Buddhas. We understand that there are people that feel that if something doesn't fit into their religious sphere, then it is... Um, it is anathema. It has to go. It has to be destroyed. And that is what Akhenaten did to the god Amun-Re. And imagine how this would have felt in your soul if you're an ancient Egyptian who's been worshiping Amun-Re. Amun-Re is a part of your um, daily ritual, perhaps. You give prayers to Amun-Re. And the king sends out a whole bunch of dudes with chisels and just starts destroying the reliefs, starts destroying the statuary, removing his name wherever he can. Um, it's heart-wrenching, it's soul-wrenching, but that is the kind of change that authoritarianism in ancient Egypt could create from the top down. And it's so interesting that some of the most overt authoritarianism finds its um, place in Egypt in an ideological or religious sense, because this is the foundation for, for Egyptian rule. Some places have a more militaristic foundation for their authoritarianism, and if they do, then you see the authoritarian ruler you know, wearing a military uniform. Um, Akhenaten is, is doing it a different way. The Egyptian authoritarianism is very religiously and ideologically grounded, which brings me to another um, insight, and you guys may want to fight me on this one. Um, and that insight is that if Akhenaten developed the first monotheism, a highly debatable point, but let's go with it for now. Akhenaten tells us that the Aten is the only god, the only true god, the, the one god in the sky who, in a sense, needs no icon, needs no statue. He is there for everyone to see. And removes um, state support from all of these other temples. And as his reign goes on, removes the names of these other gods, um, is really carefully looking at even if he associated with the, the Aten son with Re Harakti before, by a certain point in his reign, that Re Harakti god is removed. He can't have that um, in there. So he, he's being ever more monotheistic in his thinking, ever more exclusionary in his thinking about divinity. And this is, um, if monotheism is invent, invented by Akhenaten, then I would argue that the first instance of human thought about religion in such an exclusionary way was inherently political. It was also inherently narcissistically political. And what I am saying is that the best way to support a, an authoritarian leader who rules with an authoritarian personality is to connect oneself to an exclusionary religion in which there are the people on the inside and the people on the outside. And you can make clear and defined boundaries and you can support a narcissistic agenda much better with a monotheistic religion for which you are the only prophet than you can for a polytheistic religion in which there is Mother Earth, Father God, or, or Father, Father Sky, um, God of Lightning, the, the, the river goddess or God, and you have to work with nature because if you feel polytheistically that you're embedded in this world and that there are all these different beings all around you, you have to work with them. You have to negotiate with them. You have to help um, uh, them see your place and you see their place. It's a give and take. If you go monotheistic and you say, this is the God, there's no other God. I am the only prophet. I'm the only one that can speak to this God. Go to me. It's inherently going to be very politically workable um, for you. And so I see it as no mistake that monotheism appears at the same time that authoritarianism in Egypt reaches its peak. And I would argue that, and here's where some of you might be like, I don't know, um, that 
monotheism today in the Abrahamic sense, Judeo-Christian, Islamic, Muslim, uh, Judeo-Christian, Islamic, Mormon, is the way I like to think of it, the Abrahamic faiths, um, work very well, very well, can be very easily co-opted for authoritarian purposes. I am not saying that these religions have necessarily authoritarian roots like Akhenaten's new religion. Um, not at all. But I am saying they can be quite easily co-opted for an authoritarian leader to use divinity in his patriarchal masculine authoritarian image to then um, create streams of power that he would not otherwise have had. Um, so, um, so Akhenaten was the leader of a cult, somebody says. Well, I mean, kind of. Jonestown? No, I mean, so, no, because Akhenaten... And I'm just reading the, the comments for those of you that might be confused. So um, I think it's different because a cult is a grassroots thing. It is a bottom up thing. It is something that spreads through a community. Um, Christianity used to be called a Jesus cult. Um, and you can think of it that way. It spreads like wildfire amongst people on a grassroots basis. This Akhenaten thing. This new religious experiment, this creation of the Aten cult and Aten temples and Aten religion is imposed from the top. And it is, um, people are, from what we can see, made to, to change their way of worship. Um, it's hard to find direct evidence for that, but remember, authoritarian regimes do not like to say, oh, hey, you know, we killed a lot of people at gunpoint today. Um, they might leak out that information if it's of use to them, but most authoritarian regimes like to present themselves like this, you know, perfected and beautiful and kind and fatherly and good. Um, so the, the coercion that Akhenaten likely used to get a whole country of elites to move from one religious system to another religious system is not as visible to our eyes as um, we would like. And I'm reading this book um, right now for the class too, Authoritarianism, What Everyone Needs to Know by Erica Franz, um, points out something I've always known about ancient Egypt, um, but you know, it's, it's nice to have it connected to um, modern authoritarian systems as well, historical authoritarian systems, is the fact that that authoritarian systems are always cloaking and veiling and hiding what they are, which demands that the historian engage in a shit ton of, of hypothetical questioning, um, pulling veils aside, um, trying to figure out what's going on, and sometimes even outright conjecture, because the real politique is not going to be shown in one of these regimes. They're not going to tell you what's happening in the dark, smoky back room and how decisions were made. They will tell you the decisions came from on high. You know, they will be ideologically packaged. They will be perfected. They will be made to seem um, glorious and, and good. And so it's, um, it's, it's not something that um, you, you can't see the, the messy underbelly of it all. But for those of you that think that he's the leader of a cult, I mean, yeah, but it's, um, it's, it's an authoritarian personality cult of his own design. And um, it's, it's an interesting thing that when monotheism is created, if he's the one to do it, it happens from the top down, by, imposed by the state, um, by the chief priest, uh, the good God himself. And then it sits and it waits, it ferments um, this idea. And then it appears someplace again, very close to Egypt, um, around, you know, 8th century BCE, 7th century BCE, this idea of monotheism in a Yahweh cult um, in the Levant. And there it is used, again, for authoritarian personalities who are trying to take power, move kings aside, take power as king themselves, and they use this authoritarian agenda to do so. And if you want to read up about this, then just pick up your, your book of Kings, Second Kings. And um, it is extraordinary. Um, some of these kings, are they do what is right in the eyes of the Lord, and others do not. Um, but the movement from polytheism to monotheism is in that, that text. And the connection to po political reality and to life and to how religion can be used to, to support 
a, a political reality is, is very interesting to me. So um, these are all the things that I've been thinking of. This is what I introduced my class to um, yesterday. I will um, continue sharing all of these ideas with you. And um, I'll also um, share some of these videos, I think, with my class because then they will see my my whole head <laughs> as opposed to the, the tiny, tiny little head in the, in the corner of the screen. So, um, uh, but, um, you know, daily insight for today, little, little um, ideas about authoritarianism, which I think um, are very topical because as um, people get afraid, as they worry about the status quo, as they worry about, um, keeping food on the table, just all of the stresses of daily life as we all shelter in place, people are more and more drawn to authoritarianism. Um, and that is something that I also am keenly interested in. Why do the many freely, willingly give up power? Um, so much freedom um, to the one or the few. And because so much authoritarianism now is rearing its head within liberal democracies, how do people vote for it? How do they decide along that gradient of authoritarianism? Yeah, I'm, you know, we're voting for stuff, but now, you know, I'm okay with, with putting restrictions on voting for certain people, and I'm okay with making it harder for people to vote, or I'm okay with keeping this structure, and you see this, the step towards that authoritarian regime willingly. Um, that's interesting to me. Um, chilling, perhaps, yes, but still interesting. So on that depressing note, um, Everyone, um, enjoy your sheltering in place. Um, keep your family close via phone or in person. Um, try not to freak out too much with homeschooling if you're doing that. Um, you know, get the lentils out and see what you can, you can find online. Um, whatever it is the, that you're doing today. And um, don't stay up too late. I've been staying up too late. And, um, you know, try to get up by 8.45. This is my goal. <laughs> and um, everybody take care. Uh... Thank you to our listeners for your support and for subscribing wherever you listen. If you enjoyed the show, please leave a five-star review and help raise our profile and let others know about it. Send your questions related to the show and topic suggestions for future episodes to karakuni at gmail.com. You can find the video version of the show on my YouTube page and full show notes will be posted in the podcast section of my website, karakuni.squarespace.com. And for that, thank you, Amber Myers Wells. There you'll also find info on my books, upcoming lectures, and you can subscribe to my newsletter. You can find me on Facebook at Karakuni Egyptologist and on Twitter and Instagram at Karakuni. See you next time on Afterlives with Karakuni.